Good morning. I'd um, like to welcome everyone to Grand Rounds and just a few housekeeping uh, events. Um, we are video conferencing and videotaping. I'd like to remind the group, um, because we are videotaping, it's important to use the microphones towards the end to ensure that those that are either listening to this, uh, watching this via YouTube or live streaming can hear the question and, 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 and we can uh, ensure that they're getting a good response. Speaking of YouTube, I would like to highlight White Plains Hospital, Mount Sinai, New York, that's watching live. So we welcome their uh, participation in, in Ground Rounds. And as usual today, we're very excited about our State of the Heart and Vascular Center report by Dr. Alan Lumsden, who certainly needs no introduction. He's um, chairman of cardiovascular surgery and the Walter W. Fondren III uh, chair, and has been the medical director for the last several years and really has taken us to new heights, both in terms of his contribution in pushing Dicet, uh, Mighty, um, pumps and pipes and uh, numerous um, programs and, and efforts that are certainly palpable and we use this forum to understand those but certainly thank you Dr. Lumpson for for this uh, continued contribution and ground rounds and we look forward to your talk. Okay, thanks, Dr. Thank you Jerry. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and give this presentation. It's kind of a, a time of both of reflection of what we did last year and an opportunity to say what do we need to do better going forward this year. And although I'm the guy who's standing up here giving this presentation, I really represent a whole bunch of different people. The, uh, Bill Zogby, the Chair of Cardiology, uh, uh, Joe Naples here from CV Anesthesia and Critical Care, and then Joan Gook, who heads up our Department of CV Sciences. And I want to thank all of them for their support, and also all the division chiefs who sent slides forward. Now, this used to be an easy job. You know, each person would send a couple of little slides because that's really, there were only two or three people in each of these divisions. It was pretty easy to put this thing together. Now it's pretty complicated. And so I apologize to all of you who sent me some great slides and whose slides I happen not to be using. So it's typical to start off these things with a conflict of interest disclosure. And so I'm going to do that. And I would say that my disclosure is that I am completely biased in favor of supporting the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Beyond that, I really don't have any disclosures to actually make. So I thought I'd start off, and these are actually uh, Dr. Boone's slides, because at the end of the day, I think that the platform that we build the Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center is a platform that's created by our board our governance and the administrative leadership in the hospital. And sitting in the back there, see is Mary Daffin, who is the chair of our governance committee and is part of the board of directors here. And you know, the board announced yesterday a change in the leadership. Um, those, those things may not you think affect you on a day-to-day -day basis, but the financial stability of this organization and the trajectory of it is absolutely a function of our board and people like Mary Daffin who spend an inordinate amount of time. And that allows us to do the kind of things that I'm going to talk about. Believe me, I've been in other institutions where the financial infrastructure is threatened. And the first thing that happens under those circumstances is research and education go completely out of the window. So we often take it for granted uh, about the stability of this organization. But I think, as you've seen, in the, even in the medical center here, the, the changes in the financial winds that are occurring. And I think we're in great hands with the board and the, under Dr. Boom's leadership in terms of the platform that we are actually working on. So I thought I would start off, actually, by talking a little bit about what he calls is the state of the system. And as you look at this organization, yeah, Methodist has been around here for many, many, many years. Methodist in its current structure, I describe to people who come to visit us, is really this is a startup organization. If you said this company's only been around here for 12 years, you know, I think that's a startup. So Methodist reinvented itself, of course, way back basically after the Baylor affiliation ended. It took a couple of years to figure out exactly what the identity of this organization was going to be going forward. I think many of us who had done nothing but work in traditional academic structures went, we're going to do what? We're going to take a hospital and we're going to reinvent ourselves which is a full-blown academic organization. And so remember, overnight when that affiliation ended, there's no IRB, there's no graduate medical education office, there's no residents, there's no fellows, there's no medical students. There's no chairman. Now, some people still think that's a regressive move and we'd have been better off without any chairman. But nevertheless, there weren't even departments. And so we got to redefine some of these departments. And for the Houston Methodist to Bakey Heart and Vascular Center, that was a fundamental time of being able to redirect basically our resources and essentially to make departments 
from research all the way through to cardiology, CV surgery, CV anesthesia, and critical care, and make that the nucleus of the heart and vascular center. That is not easy to do by taking things away and breaking up traditional departments. So it was a problem, but an opportunity. And it's that opportunity that I think that we are reaping the benefits from, and you're going to see as I talk about some of the exciting things that are going on. And so this is a lot of changes basically have taken place here, and we're going to be very proud basically of what has happened. This hospital is a top ranked in Texas. It's now in the top 20, we're ranked number 19 in the United States. And I'm going to show you some of these quality matrices. We heard last night at the Physicians Organization board meeting that there are some really cogent arguments that we are now competing with the MGHs, the Mayo Clinics, uh, of now Johns Hopkins of this world around a number of the different matrices in which we're measured. So lots of accolades really have come. And one of the overarching measures of this is the so-called honor roll. There's four and a half thousand to five thousand hospitals in the United States, and this institution is ranked number 19 despite all of these changes that we've actually gone through. And so when you look in Texas and you look at the number of ranked specialties, we really don't have much in the way we see of competition. We are essentially, you know, the, the big dog in terms of the hospital. And one of the things that I've always said is that there are certain areas which have great heart and vascular care, uh, great pulmonary care. What's fundamentally different about this organization is excellence across the board. We don't go from having a great cardiologist seeing our patients post-op to a second-line nephrologist. They are all quality people, and that really is a huge differentiating factor for our organization. There are two matrices which uh, we predominantly use uh, to look at quality uh, as measured inside the hospital. And these are the US News um, Index of Hospital Quality, and the UHC stands for University Hospital Consortium's Quality and Safety Scores. All of these basically are a composite of different tools which are used to actually try and measure what is going on. So let me just kind of show you where our hospital ranks. So in US News, we were ranked number 19. That makes us in that, um, the honor roll. In UHC, you can actually see that the hospital was ranked number nine. So these are the two of the big measuring tools nationally. Okay, we can certainly do better than that, but when you actually look at the number of hospitals that are ranked at that level in both of these, then you're really getting down to seven or eight hospitals really across the nation. So every one of these measuring tools has different vagaries and different weighting of how it's done, but we're starting to compete. And again, last night we were looking at a variety of measures versus Hopkins versus MGH. And basically we've decided that going forward, we're gonna compete with the Mayo Clinic. They've traditionally been regarded basically as being the top hospital in the United States. And a variety of these measures allow us to get there. And so the quest for you is that um, we, we're working on a reputational score, but the argument is it comes down to focusing on the fundamentals. If we get a morbidity and mortality down to even better than we're doing at the moment, we can move the heart and vascular center up into the top 10. And so, and then as we extend out into the system, we are even beginning to be ranked in some of the national ranking systems, not just for the Methodist Hospital in the medical center, but you're starting to see our peripheral hospitals popping up. So quality across the Methodist system is really what we're looking at. And so many basically of you have seen the strategic learning map that, uh, that uh, Dr. Boom talks about. And again, it's all about the focus on our eye care values. I think a lot of us, when the kind of eye care values were kind of rolled out, kind of thought, hey, you know, it's kind of a little hokey. We're a bunch of surgeons. Do we really want to be doing that stuff? But increasingly, this idea of, of integrity, compassion, accountability, patient service is what we're going to be increasingly measured on in the future. And I think my request from all of you leaving here is we need to be focused on the fundamentals, the morbidity, the mortality, the length of stay, the readmissions, but increasingly patient service is how we're actually going to be measured out in the community. So Houston Methodist is extraordinarily well positioned. We're a high performing academic medical center that's really only about 10 years old with an international reach, renowned clinicians, and growing research enterprise. So the way we think about the heart and vascular center is 10 years ago, the cake didn't exist. We've rebuilt the cake. The cake is there. The day-to-day -day fundamentals are there. Right now, what we're talking about is we, our job now is to put the icing on top of the cake, and that is by creating nationally and internationally visible programs, and that's going to be done by bringing in national and international stars, and that's basically where we're going to, where we're going to differentiate this going forward. The network of community hospitals all are very high performers, if not the top performers in each of the communities that are out there. And you know, as you go out and visit these hospitals, these are stunning facilities with very high quality physicians. Strong balance sheet. Again, in the middle of last year, we wondered 
you know, if we weren't going to make budget last year. And so we, the hospital came in a little bit ahead of budget. But there are also some warning signs in that. And the warning signs were that our payer mix, this hospital pays the bills, by and large, for this system. The clinical operation that you're all involved in is what basically drives the, the Methodist system forward. And what happened last year, there's about a 2% change from commercial insurance over to Medicare insurance. 1% shift equals $35 million. So 2% change is about $70 million. So we came in ahead of budget because there were unexpected revenues that came in in terms of Medicare settlements from, from the year in the past. Had we been dependent on the clinical revenue stream as we have in the past, we would not have made budget. So again, uh, we have a very strong balance sheet, but the fundamentals in the financial world that would allow us to basically focus on our clinical care. Solid physician relationships basically across our specialties and engaged employees. Methodist has got many accolades for the engagement basically of the employees. <clears throat> so that's kind of the system. Let me a little talk about a little bit about people changes that have actually occurred. You recognize that guy, Bill? <clears throat> So I think that um, Dr. Quinones, of course, was the chairman, and last year we transitioned over to Dr. Zogby, whom every, everybody knows, and he's a phenomenal partner, carrying for basically the legacy of the Methodist, the big heart and vascular center. And one of you know, his areas of focus is one of the areas that we see is relatively weak in the heart and vascular center is around prevention and wellness, and that's an area we're gonna be focusing on going forward. Second person in our department that we just recruited was Dr. Tom McGilvery. I know everybody knows Bill Zogby. Where's Tom? So Tom's here. Uh, Tom joined us from MGH, and tell a little bit about him. I actually talked to a guy I know up at uh, Mass General and said, let, let me talk to you about Tom. He said, don't talk to me. He's not leaving. He's been in Boston his entire life. Rob Phillips said, those guys wear Harvard Crimson, and you ain't getting it off them. So we're delighted. You know, the guy described as the best heart surgeon up in New England has come to join us and he's going to help lead the cardiac and thoracic transplant program. So those are two big leadership changes, basically, that we've implemented really in the last year. Dr. Winner's here. I hope he's watching from at home. I mean, I, I think that I also want to acknowledge Dr. Uh, William Winners. This is probably the first time I've given this address, and he's not been sitting front and center. And just the acknowledgement of what he contributed to this organization. He also, basically, we raised the chair. This, is, this chair was announced to try and raise money uh, and to make a chair in Dr. Winner's name. It is the fastest revenue which has been raised to support a chair and the most in the history of Mathis Hospital. And I think that is really an accolade to what he has contributed. And you may think he's kicking back and, uh, and uh, do nothing basically in retirement, but that's not the measure of this guy. And these are the three different books. And if I've got time, I may read from his most recent book you know, at the end of this presentation. Yeah, something just appeared in my desk last week that I didn't even know that he was working on. So again, our thanks really to Dr. Winters. I also wanted to mention two people who we will miss. I mean, you, many of you will not know some of these individuals. They are part of the Heart Center Council, which is a group of lay people who've really contributed enormously uh, to the, they give us of their time, their intellect, uh, the resources really to support this. And so again, one of the things that is fundamentally different working here than anywhere I've ever been before is the involvement of the community in multiple different levels of the heart and vascular center. And LaVon Cox is, was involved. She's a pharmacist by training. She's uh, uh, Dennis DeBakey's wife. We lost her this year, and many of you will know Mr. Costas. The Costas Center for Cardiovascular and Nanomedicine was named after him. Phenomenal individual with a great immigrant story who's, con again, massive contributions to the heart and vascular center. Okay, so as we go forward, let me now switch over onto the departments, the heart and vascular center, research, education, um, and try to get through as much of this as I actually can. It's a little scary to see the size of the cardiology department as it's growing at the moment. And so, again, we're going from a department that had almost no people in it 10 to 12 years ago, and under Dr. Quinone's leadership, now Dr. Zogby's leadership, built you know, into a recognized world-class department. It all, the physicians were always world-class, but reinventing this you know, inside the uh, Methodist Hospital you know, is really the, is an enormous achievement. I mean, these guys have been pretty busy this year. If you look at the, the volumes of cases that are going across the board, you can see the cath lab volume is going up, the EP volumes are going up, peripheral case volume is going up, there's been a significant increase in the volumes. And one of the things we saw last night is that in the 
Houston metro area, we are the second largest provider, second to the Memorial Hermann system. But what you see is that both our competitors next door have seen a huge decline they see in their volumes. Memorial Hermann has seen about a 9, 10%, if I remember rightly, you know, over the past few years. Or Methodist has gone in exactly the opposite direction. We are slow and steady, increasing our market share, and we see that as going to continue. And that is really a function, basically, of the kind of care and the way that you're recognized in the community. We are strongly regarded, basically, as the most desirable place to have your medical care in the city of Houston. Cardiovascular image, often a measure of the activity that's taking place in the heart and vascular center. You know, if they're coming in, doesn't matter whether they're coming in for peripheral bypass or cornies, but yeah, or tabber, they're going to be drive the image and volume. And so this is often regarded as a reflection of the amount of activity that's taking place inside uh, the hospital. And you can see that these all increasing basically across the board. Now, I hate to say it, but the stars of our organization for the last few years have been the, the structural heart group. And uh, I think there's Many, too many people for me to actually mention. I gotta take my hat off to Mike Reardon, Neil Kleiman, and Steve Little, the guys basically who led the charge in doing this. Now again, we did not get in the first cut of tower sites. You know, we didn't get involved in the initial Edwards trial. Uh, we pulled this team together and really under their leadership presented to Medtronic and that allowed us basically to get in the core valve trial. And that's kind of all she wrote. You put that in the hands of these guys and this has really soared and, and this, the importance of this, these pivotal devices which come down the line are transformational for our organization. They drive the research. They then drive the imaging, the clinical volume, the caseload. And then once they're approved, they drive training. And so all of these, most of these devices basically are now approved. We have the best training center in the United States. And now we're basically the trainer. So people come from all over the country, indeed all over the world, to be trained by our physicians. That's the life cycle of these devices and why it's so critically important that when a device comes down the line that will potentially transform the way we deliver care, we need to be front and center in doing that and you will reap the benefits of that really probably for the next 10 years. And so this is an example of what we're looking at with the Valve Clinic patient visits, now seeing over 100 patients a month. This, that's the good news. The bad news, they're seeing them up in our office and you can't get in the office when Valve Clinic is running all day because there's so many patients who are actually trafficking in there. So I think the challenge for Dr. Zogby and I is we need more space and we really need another floor because what we're increasingly doing is having multi-specialty clinics. It used to be the surgeons were here, the cardiologists are here. Most of these are being modeled after the valve clinic where a patient comes in, the imaging is there, the surgeons are there, the cardiologists are there, a decision is made, and the, the patient basically walks out with a decision at the end of the day. So thank you really for all your leadership in this. You've been a kind of a model for us, not just in, in leading these trials, but also how to kind of formulate these multi-specialty clinics. Uh, and a, a, again, what happens is when you do a good job and when you enroll in these trials, reason enrollment is so important. When a company brings a trial, what they are focused on is the quality of the individuals who are implanting the devices and the speed at which you can enroll. The longer it takes to enroll, the more cost these trials incur and the slower it is before these get to marketplace. And so they want to go to high volume centers with people who are focused and who can actually enroll. And when you do that, you then get an opportunity to lead subsequent trials. And, and Mike is now the national PI. That's kind of like the, the, the gold star of, of research on five different clinical trials. That's unheard of. And to be able to bridge different companies is almost unheard of. So again, he's kind of been, a, 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 he along with Neil, his partner, and I know Mike will be the first to acknowledge that Neil's just as important in this as now leads five different clinical trials. And so you can see the TAVR growth has been huge. And if you don't have a TAVR program, you're not going to have a Valve program. And so one of the important things about this is that people will bypass the, the communities that don't have a TAVR program. Everybody wants a minimally invasive uh, a Valve place. What's important is to get them in your office. You can take patients in whatever the most appropriate direction is, but you need to have that face-to-face -face conversation. And that is basically why this is important. Not everybody who comes looking for a tower is going to get a tower, but that interface is critically important uh, to retain. And initially, we saw an increase in the surgical valves as there was this drafting effect. 
And remember, the original TAVR programs were high-risk patients. They're highly defined. You couldn't offer them to everybody. Only patients who were of high risk could actually be implanted. Uh, but increasingly, this is now moving into a low-risk study. And I think we're going to hear at ACC, you know, what the results of that low-risk trial. The data is embargoed at the moment, but I think Mike is going to be presenting that at ACC in April. Intermediate risk. Oh, I apologize. And so overall, if you add TAVR and surgical vials together, you see this fairly dramatic increase in the volume that's taken place here. Mike has also been working with John Bismuth. Uh, Mike is the national PI on this. It was a trial that was designed by John Bismuth. This is a tra another transformational trial looking at stent grafting of type A dissection. Remember, type A dissection comes in, 1% mortality per hour. You're going to the operating room. Some of these patients are really sick. And this is a study really looking at uh, that John enacted. It's been run by Gore, and Mike is the national PI in it. And they've done something that's almost impossible, and that is have three different trial centers, all in Houston, Memorial Hermann, Methodist, and Texas Heart, all basically looking at putting patients in this trial together. So congratulations. I mean, there may be a, a job for you in the Trump administration. We're going to send you to the Middle East and see if you can solve that too. <laughs> That may be easier, quite honestly, than what you've done here. So, so some of the things that are going on, <clears throat> and again, all of these things are supportive of many of these other studies that are going on. We've brought, long had an interest in 3D imaging and echocardiography, but what's been done, along with Steve Lill, Gerald Lowry, is working with the University of Houston and the mathematicians down there is to basically work to try and solve the mathematics of modeling mitral valves and how you actually will select how you're going to actually repair these. So this is really transformational work. You can see what it was published uh, down below. Increasingly, one of the really exciting announcements this year, of course, was the announcement about the creation of NMED. Eng it's an abbreviation for engineering medicine. It's a relationship with Texas A&M. Texas A&M we heard at Thomas is now the biggest university in the state. Uh, and, you know, the ability to have like 10,000 engineers. And so their engineers who are now doing medicine are going to come down here, are going to go do their clinical training here. There's going to be 30 to 40 engineering faculty housed here. And this is very important that we have an opportunity to engage with these folks early. There will be resources and funding, and we need to bring them in the direction, basically, of the cardiovascular world. And these are the kind of projects that these folks are going to want to actually engage in. And so this is a way of looking at these, modeling it before repair, after repair, and seeing how they actually need to modify these repairs. The mitral valve, again, the aortic valve now becoming passe. All the focus is now actually moving to the mitral uh, valve. And the structural heart group, Colin Barker's the one who's really been heading up the mitral valve repair. You know, with, with mitral clips, this was initially produced by Abbott. And again, we are one of the training sites really for that. This has been supported with our relationship with Siemens using TEE fluoro fusion. All of that work has been done basically up in Mighty, and that has been both presented and published really by the folks, you know, who are present in our organization. We're moving now basically from mitral valve repair to mitral valve prosthesis and percutaneous placement of the mitral valve. Now, my understanding is that mitral disease is about four to five times as common as a aortic disease. It's also a much more technically difficult challenge, both in the placement of these devices and in the engineering of these devices. But once again, we're one of only four centers. Now, I can tell you, had we not had the visibility associated with TAVR, and the success associated with TAVR, we would not probably be in this. And so this is an example of how one success leads to being involved in the next trial, leads to leadership positions in these trials, and these are the guys who have essentially been involved in, in, in putting this together. At the present time, it is transapical. Uh, there's uh, interest in it being transseptal and potentially uh, transfemoral at some point in time. So again, thank you for your leadership in this and, and what you have brought to this, and again, Steve is taking the job of uh, leading many publications in 3D printing modeling. This just started really with the flow loop. That was a flow loop that was built for us by ExxonMobil engineers. It's a kind of unique capability that we had. He then basically had 3D printing of an aortic valve. And now all of these core platforms can be turned over into the next generation of studies that are actually taking place. So Dr. Val Rabino sent me these slides on, on the EP world. And so, again, they're both a very busy clinical operation. Uh, but what he's really distinguished himself is that bringing in industry trials is, can be challenging. Building a trial based upon a concept that you have created, tested, and then get NIH money 
Now that's a whole different level of complexity and he has uniquely been able to do this here using his vein of Marshall concept that went from animal studies. So the idea is you catheterize this little vein right here and instead of having to ablate around the uh, pulmonary orifices by alcohol infusion into this, you can ablate it and treat patients with atrial fibrillation. So again, from concept to preclinical testing to phase one study, and now he's running basically a multi-center trial. This is the NIH grant that he had, he had achieved, and you can see they went through the original uh, enrollment phase, and now they're up to nearly 209 patients. That is a dramatic achievement. Uh, for a guy who's a pretty busy clinician uh, on a daily basis. So again, thank you. Now I'm going to switch gears on to kind of the newest program uh, that we are actively engaged in, both from a cardiology standpoint and a surgery standpoint. And why are we talking about congenital heart disease? And that is, as you look at the, uh, the success rate for operating on pediatric patients, and what you're going to see is that more and more patients are living into adulthood. Unfortunately, this is not fix it and forget it. As these patients grow, they often need multiple different revisions to take place. And so this is where Huey Lynn really comes in, and he's taken the role basically in leading and developing this adult congenital heart program. And so there are more than 900 pediatric congenital heart surgeons uh, procedures being done here uh, in the Texas Children's. Those patients have often traditionally gone back to a pediatric hospital so you could be a 30-year-old sitting in a pediatric hospital next to an ENA or a two-year-old or worse, maybe a 10-year-old or 11-year-old. Um, and, and so we think that those patients deserve a home in an adult hospital, but we need to build that expertise. And that expertise really occurs at two levels. It occurs basically at cardiology level. You can always tell that you really want to be a pediatric cardiologist at heart when you kind of see Disney slides basically in the middle of all of these things. And so, so Huey, you know, has led the charge. He's kind of been building this program here really for the past few years. And you can see that um, the number of patients that are being looked at are increasing exponentially. And so he needed a partner. And this is where Dr. McGilvery had a unique skill set that fit exactly one of the things that we need here. He is the, an accomplished adult congenital heart surgeon. That's the partner that Dr. Lynn needed. Now, a lot of surgeons say they do adult congenital heart. That's not quite the same thing. These are very sophisticated and complex cases. The second skill set is his, his main interest is in around the open aortic uh, disease. And so we're going to help build an aortic center right here around him and probably bring in another partner on the vascular side to work with him. And thirdly, also involved in transplant. But for the focus here was this was a way of bringing in a surgeon. We've been moving these patients either out to, the, or peripheral, to other hospitals in the medical center or actually, we really need to thank the folks at Memorial Hermann. They have been more than gracious uh, in supporting uh, Huey and also coming over here with the surgeons and doing some of the cases here. And so, and they've also been very welcoming to um, uh, Dr. McGilvery uh, be here. They're, they're a pretty select breed of people who can actually do this. So let me get, use an example, an oft shown, often shown example, but this is an example that shows you what this heart and vascular center can actually do. First of all, we have a new program that is growing under the leadership of Dr. Lim. Secondly, we started doing 3D printing. And that's really something that Steve Little, working with one of the members of the Heart and Vascular Center Council, uh, Bill DeRay, had developed a 3D printing company. And so this was a 27-year-old woman, had tetralogy of flow. Uh, she'd been turned down. She needed a pulmonary valve place, been turned down twice. She's a Jehovah's Witness, refused any blood. This is going to be a complex redo procedure, um, and nobody really wanted to do it. And so we weren't sure we could do it. And so the first thing that was done was to 3D print basically the patient's heart. And so that is driven by engineers who were working uh, you know, in Dr. Little's flow lab because pulling out and making the models is fairly sophisticated. This went off to build the ray. He built that model and he sent it back. So the first question is, okay, we're able to build a model. Does it bear any resemblance to actually the, the, the actual heart itself? And so this is up in Mighty. Um, and this is in a lab that was donated by Siemens, one of our corporate partners. We can rescan the model, backfuse it onto the CT scan, and we can tell you whether or not the model is accurate. The model is accurate. Huey then practiced doing a procedure. Can you just put a balloon with the stent in? Problem was the pulmonary outflow tract was too big for the stent that was going to be put in there. So we couldn't really do what was the ideal procedure. So what was done in this situation, the right ventricular outflow tract was too large. So what was done in this situation, PA was too big. 
We needed to minimize blood loss for obvious reasons, and we needed to put in a valve. And so this was modified. Basil Romlai was our partner at that time, deserves the credit as a cardiac surgeon. Took a patient to the operating room, um, very carefully dissected out the, the root and the front of the heart. We used a colorimetric measurement of blood loss. This entire procedure was done with 25 cc's basically of blood loss. He then punctured the front of the, the right ventricle using kind of techniques that we now use for pulmonary embolectomy. And through that, he put a, a balloon in a valve after Basil narrowed the outflow track. So if you can't get the, the valve, to fix the, the outflow track, make the outflow track fit the valve. So that's basically, here you see a sternotomy with the sternal retractors in here. The sheath is going directly into the heart. The valve is being deployed, and the valve is now competent. And this is the patient postoperatively. She did remarkably well. There's a fairly big team of people who were involved in the preparation for this. But this is something that touched so many different parts of the heart center. And again, team is an often overused word. I mean, this is the definition, basically, of what a team sport actually was. And again, as with all of our programs, not only do we want to deliver superb clinical care, we want to build the research infrastructure to support it, and we want to build the education program. And the education program, when I get to, we're interested in public education, we're interested in all levels of cardiovascular education, and this was a program built for patients. Uh, to bring in patients and their families here. Uh, this is a very unique program, very interesting one. Again, I'll show you the slide. You figure out, you know, what the program actually is. It's pretty easy. I do believe that's Dr. Lynn in the bottom left-hand corner, and I do believe that's his tongue that's sticking out to the left side. That's okay. <laughs> so moving on to heart failure. Again, we're now starting to fire all the way basically across the board. You can see the heart volume is excellent. The VAD volume is increasing. The lung volume has dropped down a little bit, um, but we'll, we'll come back. We have little doubt, basically, about that. And one of the things that we were acknowledged this year, we actually got accolades. We had the top survival in heart transplants in the United States as determined by a group called CareCheck. That's very important to us. We're participating in numerous national clinical trials and are really the top enrollers in a significant number of these. And again, this is only going to continue to get bigger and better. One of the strategic decisions that we made was to build a uh, CTEF program. CTEF stands for Chronic Thromboembolic Pulmonary Hypertension. Patients who have probably blood clots going up over a long period of time only block off so many arteries, pressure rises, they get right heart failure. And those are the sickest of the sick patients who come here. And we've said we really have not been operating these patients. They have been going down to San Diego, which is a unique experience. Uh, we thought really that we could build this program here. And this is another example of a multidisciplinary approach to this. We took a team from, and the financing for this all came from our heart center council. They give us discretionary money. Uh, leadership talks about it. We thought this was something worth investing in. And so we took a, an anesthesia team, a critical care team, the surgical team, basically the cardiology team, all went down and spent some time watching how the operation was created. Uh, by operation, I mean the entire process, because the operation itself is the minimal part of this. Um, and we emulated that. Now, at the same time, there's a group in Japan that have started doing um, pulmonary angioplasty for patients who've got more peripheral disease. And so another team went out to Japan and spent four or five days there. Huey Lin actually scrubbed in those cases out in Japan. And we are now in the process, basically, of starting to screen patients. And so there's a CTEF screening program because, as I say, these are very sick patients, and we want to introduce that uh, carefully and progressively. The cardio-oncology program, the clinic will go live in February 2017. I'm not talking about heart tumors. We're just talking about patients who have uh, cardiotoxicity from um, uh, various different chemotherapeutic agents. Heart failure is a dominating force in terms, basically, of the cost of drivers in our hospital. And it's one of the areas where we really do need help in, um, in managing the, the recurrent admissions from the patients and the, uh, the length of stay in these patients. And again, where's Dr. Park? She's kind of take the lead role in setting up these heart failure disease management clinics. So when the patient's discharged, they're going to be kind of routinely followed up. And there's you know, almost like clinical care coordinators who are going to help this. Heart failure is the single biggest Medicare cost driver in the United States, and so there's a lot of focus on that, and it's an area that we can certainly use your help and, and, and focus on this. Second on your, again, same theme. Each of these programs has started to build supplementary educational programs. Heart, Houston Heart Failure Summit and an inaugural, an inaugural 
Pomni embolism and CTEF summit uh, but in March 9th and 10th will occur here. And this is kind of being put together by our DICET team, and we'll, we'll talk about that. The VAD volume, they have excellent outcomes and continues basically to increase robustly. And you can see as we look at these different trials that we, in, in this side, of the, the device side, we're high in rollers in this. So we talked about TAVR, uh, we talked about open aortic surgery. Of course, there's also this minimal uh, uh, intermediate route, which we think that we can also continue to grow. Ross Rule joined us from um, uh, Texas Heart, and he and Mahesh Ramchandani are proponents basically of mixed cab, mixed AVR, and so they are essentially continuing to grow this program. There is an intermediate op option in terms of uh, performing uh, these procedures. It is supported by what is now kind of increasingly recognized nationally and internationally. It's supported by ISMEX, which is one of the minimally invasive cardiac surgery programs of the cardiac re-evolution, and that's going to happen here in a, in a couple of months, and we encourage you all to participate in it. The vascular program, not so much the vascular program, but the structure of the heart center was actually featured by the advisory board talking about how we have managed to pull these different components uh, into one uh, combined heart and vascular center with chairmen who are focused on a particular service line. We take it for granted, uh, but there are a lot of people around the country that we are the envy of those organizations in terms of the structure. And the other component of this is being able to capture the imaging inside the heart and vascular center. Uh, when you tell other places that we have our own MRI and we have our own CT and we have our own uh, nuclear, uh, they're, they're kind of a gas, and, and that's really a model that was set up by Dr. Quinones and Dr. Zogby, and we think basically we'll, it, it continually reaps dividends across the platform of cardiovascular care. Almost everything that we talk about in these programs depends upon these core imaging platforms to keep the kind of level uh, that we've reached. And as Dr. Zogby kind of moved up into the chairman's position, Dr. Shah, who we can't even get a seat for, is now leading the, um, the, the imaging component of it. So again, thank you. We look forward to moving, uh, moving that forward. So now let's switch over to research. So again, as this organization was rebuilt, many of us thought it's kind of a little weird structure that we kind of the research institute is building. And part of that is you're rebuilding an organization. Now increasingly what we are now doing, you know, much like we've done in, in the clinical specialties is hardwiring, integrating these components together. And that's really where John Cook kind of came along. John basically we recruited from Stanford. So we picked the guys from Harvard, we picked the guys from Stanford. Yeah, that's what we want to continue to do. And, and I, I really need to take my hat off for John because he's done this uh, par excellence in helping building um, the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences. And so I would encourage all of you to talk to John and to see increasingly how we can leverage the growing research mission. There are a lot of people, I think one of the things that we had recently I'll tell you the story. I was walking out of here one night. I'm walking across the, 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 the bridge, and I happened to bump into Mark Boom, and he said, um, so what are you, where are you going? I said, well, Mark, I'm going to date night in the heart center. And he kind of stopped for a minute. He says, you, you, you're going to do what? Because <laughs> you weren't quite sure. We pushed we push the envelope a little bit, and he weren't quite sure if this was beyond the bounds. I said, well, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, what we're trying to do is bring our research folks together with the clinicians. And so we had to meet your research date. And so we invited, there were medical students from Baylor, the medical students from A&M, um, there were uh, re residents, fellows, attendings, all came here and we had, you know, John basically had set up like two to three minute presentation. Here's what I'm interested in, here's what I need. And we rapid fire went through, so to try and integrate the research basically in the clinical operation. And we're gonna do this again. We'll do it probably a couple of times a year. And it's an opportunity just to meet one another and figure out, you know, if Somebody else has got the tools that you need really to solve some of these clinical problems. So you can see that there are massive uh, milestones which have been achieved by John. I can't really kind of go through all of these. I think his story on uh, proton pump inhibitors, you know, won this best manuscript award from Circulation Research, that is no mean feat. That is, that is a big deal. And this has been featured both nationally and internationally. And as has a lot of his other work. And you can see that this went from having two or three people in the Research Institute to now we're filling the entire stairwell, basically, that's over there. And you can tell this, you can see how this was actually featured. Was that the New York Times? This was in? I can't remember which article it was. And so they built this RNA core, so they're now actually basically building therapeutic messenger RNA that can actually be provided you know, beyond the walls, basically, of this, uh, of this organization. 
And as you can see, the RNA Corps has some significant achievements. It got fund, funding achieved from CPRIT, which is kind of the big funding, cancer funding organization um, in Texas. And it continues really to build these in some of these platforms. And thank you for that, John. Circulation research, uh, again, talked about this brief ultra-rapid communication came out, and I got this slide last night on proton pump inhibitors and how it accelerates the endothelial senescence. And that's been one of John's themes is basically on senescence and what controls it. So this is really late-breaking news, and again, just continues to feature us. And here's John getting that award for the best manuscript that's out there. So that's one little part. This is more of the basic science element. There's also this huge clinical trial apparatus that really has to be managed, which is kind of pretty unwieldy. And John really has helped us all in, in reorganizing this. And I'll show you what these RAG groups actually are. And so RAG groups basically are research affinity groups. So we try to break the heart center down into the areas basically of a structural heart, for example. Vascular would be another one. Uh, imaging may be another one. And you can see that that's the way that these are managed. Each of these groups now has a leader. And each of those leaders basically gets both the financial information uh, and has some control basically of personnel and directing to have to approve the clinical trials that are coming on board. And we continue to increase the number of clinical trials and we continue to increase the revenue which is actually occurring. You can see 2016 is not complete yet, but you can see the publication report really continues to increase year after year after year. And so now where Susmita is, Susmita took over the reins, hey Susmita. Um, of organizing this, we kind of stole her over from the UT system where she had a phenomenal reputation and she's really done a great job in organizing this. And so this year we're going to finish ahead of budget. Uh, that means there's profit now being generated out of the, the, the clinical trial organization and that's really where it should be. Now a lot of that is heavily weighted on the structural heart group. So the TAVR uh, program, you know, is probably the most lucrative clinical trial ever run at Methodist Hospital. So that's great, but it also is vulnerable because it's not going to be like that forever. So while we thank you really for the contributions that you guys have made both clinically and also from an economic standpoint, this needs to be diversified basically as we move forward. And this is how John really structured the research affinity groups. Uh, Bill and John and I chair it, uh, but it, it boils down to the leadership in each of these different groups to try and actually support it and to, and to organize it. A little bit about on philanthropy, marketing, PR, business development. This is just the foundation is the philanthropic fundraising arm of the Heart and Vascular Center. And if you're here, put your hands up so everybody can actually basically identify where you guys are. We've got the lone representative today. That's good, though. Um, they do a great job for us. We set priorities on an annual basis of where we really want to kind of raise money. For example, the Arnold Chair is an example. This is work that's done uh, by the foundation. This is critical. We think that we need more chairs going forward. It allows us to buy time for busy clinicians and to give them discretionary funds to, to grow the organization. We sit down with marketing we, and we identify what our goals are. And our goals really are two, increase our national reputation. Now we've got a good reputation, but if you look at it in US News and World Report, it really has stuck. And we think that part of that is because we are a new organization. We used to be affiliated with Baylor, and now we're not. Now we're affiliated with Cornell. Well, that's confusing even the people you know, who are here at the moment. And so it's about defining what our identity actually is. Once you've been here, you get it. But explaining this to people from around the country is, is, is not that easy. And there are a number of different strategies, and I'll talk about them from an educational program about how we're actually trying to, trying to develop that. I don't really have time to go through this. As the com Marketing is changing in terms of support. I think you've all seen these, uh, we changed the name to Houston Methodist. I think it's a great move. I think I call it the Big M is a great brand that we're actually utilizing. Our marketing is changing and becoming much more aggressive. We're going to show you some examples of what we just did down at the Society of Thoracic Surgery. And George Kovacek is with the PR department, is very effective in getting us into the Houston Chronicle. He's the guy who got Tom McGilvery um, in the Houston Chronicle. Um, and you, most of you saw that basically last week. We're also trying to leverage the education programs as a way of getting the word out. We believe that if you bring people down here, I introduce them to the faculty, and I show them this organization, they get it. And that's really a focus and really of what we're trying to, and trying to do. And so greater emphasis is going to occur basically on social media. Um, we encourage you to use the PowerPoint templates. Where's Huey? Uh, and, and increasingly, we're going to talk a little bit about Yosemite a little bit later. This is Randlin. Where's Randlin? Hopefully Randlin's here. There's Randlin. Stand up. Randlin 
is the key marketing person who's really done a phenomenal job. Uh, this was her known at the Society of Thoracic Surgery last week. We may have emphasized heart tumors a little. There's probably more banners than there are heart tumors in the United States, but I tell you, <laughs> there's a lot of banners. And so when you, as you walk through, this is the lobby of the Hilton. You know, and this is the SDS uh, Daily Magazine that Randlin is holding up there. These are the walkways going from the Hilton and the Marriott into the convention center. And we were all over them. As you went in the convention hall, this is Naveen actually, so it's kind of a little unusual. Uh, this is the new model for our booth. This booth will go, be changed a little bit, and it'll be uh, conference specific uh, to go to ACC. But we did something very different here. We've kind of featured some of the interesting technologies that we have. On the left side is EchoPixel, a 3D viewer, which I need to get all the imaging guys to look at because it's stunning. Uh, here is uh, Naveen, he's with Storch, and this is a remote viewing robot. I really believe that remote viewing, remote support, remote proctoring is something that we can run with and absolutely define a future in that along with some of our partners. And so there's a lot of traffic came through this booth. We use this technology to track people in there, and then our marketing and PR and business development people basically have got them. And with those partners, this is the Siemens booth, believe it or not, and featured in there happens to be Mahesh and me. I'm he's a basket of and doing, doing a lung nodule localization. I don't know if that went down very well with the thoracic surgery group. But again, by partnering with these folks, um, this is kind of the sort of thing that we can do. Now, they did great, but then when I walked outside, Randlin, I want you to take notice. You know, this is what we're kind of expecting when you go down to ACC. You know, you can, you've moved it up an enormous amount, but there's clearly another level that we can actually achieve. So, Michael, I showed this to Michael. He said, unlimited budget for you at ACC. We expect the front of the conference center to look like the heart and vascular center. And, and let me just show you some of the, the this, was, this is running in our booth. And I think it's a very high quality production. This is the thing that's kind of running continuously, really, in the background. Sometimes we bring in models. Sometimes we just got to do with the stuff that we've got here. <laughs> and it features what our new space is going to look like, what our reputation basically has been. 3D printing. And so I think this is a very high class video that was created showing some of the, the new things that are being done here. This is available to everybody. Now again, when you talk about core platforms, I think that Dyset is an example basically of a core, core platform. Now, let's go back a little bit. This was actually funded by the DeBakey Foundation and uh, they gave us $8 million. That's a lot of money um, to create the premier cardiovascular training environment in the world. And I would submit to you that we got it. Uh, there's not many places that come close to competing with the breadth of educational content and the facilities that we actually have. And I described this at our board I said, I want us to be the Khan Academy for cardiovascular disease. Who all knows what the Khan Academy is? This is going to break down along an age range. <laughs> yeah, so Khan Academy is just a resource for if you want to know something, you can go there and get high quality education. I would like us to be the Khan Academy for cardiovascular disease. I want people when they want to learn about proton pump inhibitors or they want to learn about thoracic aortic aneurysm that the first place they go to is Houston Methodist Debakey Heart and Vascular Center. And if we don't have it, then they go to the other guys, not the other way around. And that's kind of where we're pushing this whole concept forward. There's multiple different components to this. And I'm going to highlight this to, to some extent here. Melanie Lazarus, Melanie, put, put your hand up in the air, now leads this team. She came over uh, from Texas Heart, where she'd been doing similar things around social media. Um, where's the uh, The guys in the corner you've seen every week. These are the hardest working people around here. Uh, Roger and Tyree do the AV support. Now, that means sometimes at 7 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night uh, that they're actually supporting. All the video editing has been done by them, all the capture has been done, and it's extraordinarily high quality and we're gonna to continue to build this. And I don't know what everybody else from the DICET team is, they can put their hand up, because it's important that you, you all know who these folks actually are. Susan's the, you know, the editor of the journal, along with Dr. Quinones, and Ibun is a PhD in education. And so what we wanna do is the, uh, is the science of education. And the best example of this comes from Huey Lin. He built a transradial access model in a cadaver, and he, he tested that basically during the finishing school. He's got data generated from that, and that's going to be presented really at the ACC. So we're now running a lot of courses here. And over 17,000 people have either gone. Now, these are face-to-face. -face. This is not 
the video conference center, things that are going out. These are all people, and they include some of the internal uh, programs that we're running, you know, has dramatically increased. And this is another way we see as a tool by which we can uh, change the, the reputational score nationally. And so you can see large numbers just continue to increase, and this is going to increase even further. The hands-on part of it obviously takes place up in Mighty, lots of conferences and symposia, and increasingly we're building patient programs. The adult congenital program for patients is an example of that. Save a Life, which was also created by one of our Heart Center Council members, took place down at Minute Maid Park, in which we had probably 300 people there that were teaching CPR and how to use defibrillator. So, and, and, but we see the future as being online streaming of this. I think gone are the days where you come down here on an airplane, sit here, and receive a lecture from me. We need to differentiate ourselves, but if you're going to come down here, we're going to teach you something. You're either going to face to face with our faculty, or you're going to basically taught how to do skills. And that is kind of the focus on it that we will move the didactic content basically on, into online. A lot of that at the moment is through Facebook and YouTube. That is going to change basically in the future, it's going to become much more organized. The journal under Dr. Quinona's leadership is, has been huge in terms of also getting our reputation out there. This is also available online. Many of you have been heavily involved in some of these programs. These are just examples of the programs that are out there. This happened to be Save a Life down at Minute Maid Park. Re-evolution, of course, is coming up. And I want to show you an example of the kind of online content. This is being live streamed. I watched Al Raisner's uh, Heart Center Grand Rounds from... El Salvador. Don't ask me why we're in El Salvador, but we were in El Salvador watching it, watching it live. You can watch this from anywhere in the world. And one of the reasons this is being watched in New York is because we heard recently from other cardiologists who watched some of the grand rounds um, and talked about the quality of that, and they're now starting to use our live stream content, hopefully for some of their CME. I really need to find out if I can get CME for an hour for me giving the lecture. That would be the ultimate. You know, I don't know if I'm excluded. And I want to give you, and you can see we get these statistics that are coming back, whether it'll be more robust in the future. I want to show you some examples. Basically, many of these technologies can be used for many others besides the heart. Has really evolved tremendously. Hello, my name is Esther Pilato. I'm the technical director of the Vascular Lab Cardiovascular Surgery Associates at the Houston Methodist Hospital. So the first was Dr. Zogby's Grand Runs, okay? That is the most watched video in our YouTube portfolio. That's been watched nearly five and a half thousand times. We can track all of them. What you just saw from Esther was a technical presentation, how to do it. And there are so many different things of technical aspects that we can actually learn how to do it. This is Mahesh. You could do anything with. What you're seeing on the front over here is the right ventricle. This is for... Kids, uh, this is for anybody. It's kind of a heart surgeon's the heart anatomical the description of the heart. Midline towards the left, and the right side of the heart comes to the front. This patient does not have a normal functioning heart. I'm going to lift the heart up now. And you, you may begin to appreciate that the heart doesn't so much as contract as twist upon itself. If you look at the apex, you'll notice how the heart... So all of these things have been conceived, delivered, recorded, edited, and presented by our group internally. And these folks are here to help the Heart and Vascular Center. And so there is an education committee, and uh, we, we have to protect them to some extent. And we want to make sure that you know, we're producing high quality uh, productions. What we think as we start turning on, we've avoided the gory picture so far. We're about to start turning on how, how I do it. We'd like this portfolio of how I do it things from Houston Methodist to Bakey Heart and Vascular Center, that we think we know about the platforms to show this in a very, very uh, good way that, that will represent us well. This was me watching Al down in, in El Salvador. So these guys basically thank you really for what you're doing. The future of DICE are these techniques videos. Increasingly, the science of education is what's important. I would ask that when we run courses, in each course, we should think of one question that we can collect data around, so that as we come out of that course, We've used the test subjects to collect data and that we are going to publish a presentation on how we teach better and we continue to learn from that. I keep talking about this remote education. We have a unique, a, a unique opportunity to actually help teach how to deliver remote support, remote proctoring, even technical support, you know, from some of our radiology techs, cath lab techs, 
Teleconference is something that we've got up and working pretty robustly. We have partnered with a lot of people in industry and we'll continue to do that. DICET, as the new learning management system is, is introduced, needs to generate a, a revenue stream. Ultimately, we've been very used, uh, grateful from the fact that we got this contribution from the DeBakey Foundation. Uh, going forward, we need to build sustainability into this. We can't continue to depend upon people giving us money. And so that's what the focus of next year is how do we build revenue streams into some of these things. Pumps and pipes just want to talk about, because this is another example. This was up at the Exxon Mobil Energy Center. This webcast, and this is the power of webcast in nearly 5,000 venues across the United, uh, not just the United States, but across the world. And each of these dots are where people were watching this. So, this is, so the, the, the ability to broadcast, to create a brand, to get the word out this is actually going to take place, and to extend beyond AC Houston, beyond the United States, the vision of the Heart and Vascular Center, I think is, this shows you an example of what can actually be achieved with this. In the next few slides, I'm just going to run through as I start closing. April 2015, a hole in the ground. And I, was, I go over there to Mighty, and I usually take a picture every couple of months and start to watch this tower gradually appear out of the ground. And I went up there yesterday, and now I need a wide-angle camera because I can't actually get the whole thing on my iPhone anymore. And so... This is where we're moving to. And I've said that, you know, we have built the structure of the Heart and Vascular Center. Um, a lot of icing has been put on top of this cake. I, I'm going to actually show a picture of a OR schedule from the opening day in Fondren Brown OR in 1960. Our operating room, sometimes I think the catalogs may be even older than that, to be honest with you, when I visit them there. But that operating room has been running for nearly over 50 years. It started with three operating rooms and has continued to expand. And so our ICUs are functional, I guess would be the way that one would put it. And the missing piece for the Heart and Vascular Center has been the, our infrastructure uh, that we're working in. It's very, we provide great care, but it's not what we want to represent, you know, who we are. And so... You know, we're delighted that the board has approved us. This. this is where we're going to move to just over a year from now. Well, at the end of this year, we'll be focused on the transition. That could be a little rough, but it, it will be planned out, and we will move into you know, nearly 32 suites between operating rooms and cath labs. Every one of those suites will have video broadcast and recording capability. That is enormous power to start telling our story a little bit more. And this, I think, is going to be an extraordinarily important story. Well, let me do something a little unusual uh, to finish this off. Not that it's uh, unusual. This is Dr. Winter's book. Okay, this appeared on my desk last week. <clears throat> I got to tell you, it's un unbelievable. It says, Rumination of a Synchronist. You know what a synchronist is, Mike? Well, neither did I. It's actually a form of poetry, believe it or not. And there's about a five-page description of the history of Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. It's incredible. I don't know if anybody even knew he was doing this, did you? So hopefully he's watching. I'm going to read you only the last four verses of this, and then I'm going to be done. <clears throat> it says, in 2016, a change in the guard, a new high, high profile, now in charge. William Zogby is the name, now in charge of the game, brings to cardiology a new wild card. The cardiovascular deck is now fully loaded. Nothing there looks outmoded. The research institute is there with John Cook, the chair, so cardiovascular science will roll us paroded. And as I look out my window, I see the skeleton of what soon will be, a new hospital to sit on the north campus where it will be MDHVC's new home. Yippee! <laughs> I'm so excited for the future, I could shout. So I will, as this old guy on the way out. Look forward, not back, to the front of the pack. And remember, attitude is the key, no doubt. Thank you. Anyone have any burning questions? If not, thank you all for your support. We really appreciate it and look forward to a great 2017.
Uh, we actually did start uh, when we separated with uh, Baylor with seven faculty anesthesiologists, zero residents, and one CRNA, and we have blossomed into this huge program now with uh, residents from three separate uh, institutions, four of our own fellows, and about 20 CRNAs. And I wanted to say, uh, I just wanted to recognize several anesthesiologists that have made um, really amazing contributions to all of these programs. Dr. Hani Samir, who really spearheaded the heart failure uh, section. Um, Dr. Karnbir Singh, who uh, really made significant contributions to, and continues to make contributions to the interventional cardiology, and also Dr. Gary Montero, who is spearheading the congenital uh, heart surgery program. Thank you. Thank you.